So this is Lecture 3, Motivation and the Appeal of Expressivism. The view I've been defending has two important features in common with Alan Gibbard's expressivism and Simon Blackburn's quasi-realism. It does not presuppose normative properties in the natural world, and it interprets claims about reasons as reactions to the natural world, or, more specifically, as claims about the appropriateness of certain reactions to that world. Where my view differs most obviously from Blackburn's and Gibbard's is in maintaining that normative claims can be true or false, although more needs to be said about how much this comes to. My view also differs from these non-cognitivist views in the explanation I offer of the motivational power of normative claims, and today's lecture will be devoted to examining this latter difference, to considering how much it comes to and how my cognitivist version can be defended. I'll begin with this second difference. It's often said that an adequate account of reasons for action must explain how they motivate people to act. But it's not clear exactly what kind of explanation is thought to be required. The term motivate has a famously dual character. This is brought out by considering the contrast between my view and a desire theory, which is generally seen as providing a more satisfactory explanation of the kind in question. On the one hand, when it's said that only desires can motivate and that beliefs are motivationally inert, the motivation in question may be a kind of causal efficacy. But motivate also has a rational or even normative aspect. Desires are not only supposed to cause actions, but also to rationalize them, as Donald Davidson famously said. I take this to mean at least that a desire makes an action which is believed to promote the satisfaction of that desire understandable, or perhaps even makes it rational. If to rationalize an action is to make it understandable, and even rational for the agent to so act, then it would seem that an agent's belief that she had a reason to perform the action even even if it is a belief, could rationalize her action just as well as any desire could. It would make sense of it. So the supposedly unique motivational efficacy of desires and the corresponding deficiency of cognitivist accounts of reasons may lie in the former idea of motivation, the more causal one. Desires frequently come to us unbidden. I would say they generally do. And we may feel that they impel us to action, at least on some occasions. But this doesn't mean that an explanation of action in terms of an agent's desires is a causal explanation in a way in which an explanation of that action in terms of the agent's beliefs about reasons would not be. Beliefs about reasons are also not subject to our will or choice, I would say, and they can have a demanding quality. I may not like the fact that I have a strong reason to go to the doctor, do exercise, study mathematics, whatever it might be. The deeper point, however, is that neither in the case of desires nor in the case of beliefs about reasons is this experience of being impelled or pushed toward doing something a direct experience of a cause. The feeling is simply an element in our momentary experience. If such experiences are generally followed by actions, this is because of some underlying neural mechanism that is equally causal in the two cases, and in neither case, I'm assuming, an object of experience. Even if the belief that one has a reason to act in a certain way can rationalize that action, as I said, that is, can make sense of it, more needs to be said about how and in what sense such a belief could explain action. On my view, this explanation relies on the larger idea of a rational agent as a being of a certain kind. A rational agent is first a being that's capable of asking questions about the reasons he or she has for performing certain actions or for holding other attitudes. Second, a being is a rational agent only if the judgments that it makes about reasons make a difference to the actions and attitudes that it proceeds to do and have. A perfectly rational agent would always have attitudes and perform actions that are appropriate according to the judgments about reasons that that agent accepts. A rational agent will generally intend to do those actions that he or she judges him or herself to have compelling reason to do, 
and will generally believe a proposition if he or she takes him or herself to have good evidence for its truth. A perfectly rational agent would always do these things. None of us is perfectly rational, but it is appropriate to call us rational agents just in case we come sufficiently close to meeting this standard. When a rational agent does something that he or she judges him or herself to have reason to do, this judgment makes sense of the action in normative terms and explains it, explains it in this sense, by making it what one would expect of a rational agent to whom that judgment could be attributed. Presumably there's also a causal, sorry, is this going off? Yes. yes. Presumably there's also a causal explanation. <laughs> This was a bit of stages. It wasn't brilliant. <laughs> There's some underlying cause operating here, or not operating, as the case may be. Um, it's I think it might have been turned off somewhere else. I don't know. Anyway, you, I'll, I'll we'll turn it over to, to the technician. As I was about to say, uh, a rational agent will generally intend to do, to do those actions that he or she judges him or herself to have compelling reason to do and believe a proposition if he or she takes him or herself to have good evidence for its truth. A perfectly rational agent will always do these things. None of us is perfectly rational. Um, I, I, I skipped back, didn't I? Okay. Here's where I was. I said, presumably, there's also a causal explanation of this connection and of the more general uniformities that I've referred to. But these causal connections are another story for neurobiologists to fill in. Now compare this explanation with the one offered by expressivist theories. The accounts that they offer are like mine in emphasizing the rationalizing aspect of motivation rather than the causal aspect. Looking back to earlier non-cognitivists, R.M. Hare wrote that moral judgments must be understood as expressing the acceptance of imperatives because the acceptance of an imperative, he said, is the only kind of judgment that is logically linked with action. That is, he said, it's the only kind of judgment such that if a subsequent action of an appropriate kind is not performed, it follows that the agent spoke insincerely or did not understand what he or she was saying. More recently, Alan Gibbard, in Thinking How to Live, analyzes judgments about reasons, in this case not necessarily moral judgments, but judgments about what one has most reason to do, as decisions about what to do or as the adoption of certain plans. Each of these accounts, whether imperatival or in, in terms of adopting uh, plans, is like my account in explaining the connection between normative judgment interpreted in one way or another and action by appealing to an ideal, a psychological ideal of a being of a certain kind. What Hare mentions as part of this, what I'm calling the relevant ideal in his case, is linguistic competence, understanding the meaning of words, and logic, as he calls it. But he also, I would say, is appealing to a kind of practical consistency, that is, acting in accord with the imperatives one accepts. In Gibbard's case, the, the appeal is curly to an ideal of practical rationality. That is, the acceptance of a normative judgment not only makes sense of or rationalizes an action, but also explains it because rational agents are so constituted that they generally do what they have decided to do and generally carry out the plans they have adopted. If they don't do these things, if they still have decided to do something but they don't do it or they have the plan, they don't carry it out, then they are being irrational. All three of these explanations of the connection between normative judgment and action Hare's explanation, Gibbard's explanation, and my own explanation are naturalistic. That is, they all refer to psychological types. But the, and although these psychological types are, in one sense, ideal, that is, they involve standards that most of us don't meet, nonetheless, the states of mind that these types, and a description of someone as belonging to one of these types refer to, uh, are entirely naturalistic psychological states. And the identification of some individual as belonging to one of these types is an empirical matter. The mental state of judging something to be a reason 
refers to something non-naturalistic, that is, a normative truth. And this may be the contrast that Gibbard and Blackburn have in mind when they describe their accounts as more naturalistic than their rivals, like mine. But the state of holding uh, this view, that is, the state of believing that something is a reason, is just as naturalistic a state as adopting a plan, or for that matter, having a desire. There are, however, important differences between these accounts, which I should now explore. One difference between the non-cognitivist views and my cognitivist account lies in the nature of the ideal type that is referred to. In my case, it is an ideal of rationality understood explicitly in terms of the acceptance of judgments about reasons. Their accounts avoid this, as I said, appealing instead to plans, imperatives, or pro-attitudes. Another difference is that my account construes the acceptance of such judgments, judgments about reasons, as a kind of belief, as the kind of thing whose object can be true or false, and whose whose adoption can be correct or incorrect. Although it is a belief of a special kind, in my view, that is, a belief that's linked by rational requirements to attitudes other than other beliefs. So we need to consider how these differences matter, and whether the differences provide reasons for preferring an account of one of these kinds rather than the other. First, it might be claimed, as Gibbard does claim, that non-cognitivist accounts give a deeper explanation of our normative attitudes. They explain what it is to judge something to be a reason, rather than taking this idea for granted, as I do. It is true that non-cognitivists identify normative judgments, as I would say, the acceptance of reasons, with states, such as pro-attitudes, acceptance of imperatives, the adoption of plans, or decisions about the thing to do, that do not explicitly involve the idea of a reason, but which nonetheless have implications for subsequent action and subsequent attitudes of the kind that normative attitudes are supposed to have. The question is whether this identification of the normative attitude that I would call the adoption, the the belief in a reason, uh, but but here is being identified with something else, whether this identification provides an informative explanation of normative judgments or instead changes the subject by identifying normative judgments with something quite different. The question of which of these is the case is in part the the question which Gibbard calls the question of internal adequacy, namely the question of whether the expressivist analysis, this is a quote from Gibbard, accounts for everything internal to normative thinking, or everything internal that is intelligible. What does internal adequacy require? It requires that an account of normative judgments should explain the distinctive significance of such judgments for subsequent action and other attitudes. This is what I've so far been discussing. In addition, internal adequacy seems to require two related things. The first is that an account of normative judgments should do justice to the thought that these judgments can be mistaken, and if correct, would be correct even if one did not make them. To take an example that Alan Gibbard cites, an internally adequate account of normative judgments should be able to make sense of the possibility of a person who thinks that it's wrong to kick dogs for fun and thinks that this would be wrong even if he misguidedly believed that dog kicking was perfectly acceptable behavior. Second, an internally account of normative judgments should give a satisfactory account of their use in interpersonal discourse such as in giving advice or discussing the justifiability of what someone has done. These requirements pose problems for expressivist views because those views interpret making a normative judgment as doing something, such as expressing an emotion, adopting a plan, or accepting an imperative, something that it would seem one can do only for oneself, and doing something that has normative force and efficacy, even for oneself, only when one is actually doing it. Gibbard and Blackburn are aware of these problems and have responses to them. I'll focus here on Gibbard's response. Holding that there is a fact of the matter, 
independent of us about what we ought to do, that, for example, we ought not to kick dogs for fun, is, on Gibbard's view, a matter of, here's a quote, planning to avoid kicking dogs for fun, planning this even for the contingency of being someone who approves of such fun and who is surrounded by people who approve, end of quote. But is this intelligible? What does it mean to plan not to do X, even for the contingency in which one approves of doing X? It doesn't seem that one can plan to do something under certain circumstances while knowing or even believing that if, we're in, if one were in those circumstances, one would not do what one is purportedly planning. It's not a plan that makes sense. Similarly, when one judges that someone else has conclusive reason to do something, as we do when we're giving them advice, let's say, one can't be deciding that they will do it or planning for them to do it. Planning and deciding are things one can only do for oneself. On Gibbard's view, what one is doing in such a case is planning to do this thing for the contingency in which one is in that person's situation in all relevant respects. But it seems, to me at least, strained to speak of planning to do something in a situation one knows one will never be in. Gibbard recognizes the strain I've been calling attention to that's raised by cases of these two kinds. Fully-fledged planning, he says, involves both coming to an answer about what to do in certain circumstances and expecting, quote, that that thing is what one really will do if the contingency arises, end of quote. Cases of contingency planning of the kind just mentioned, he recognizes, lack this second aspect. I can't expect that I really will uh, not kick dogs for fun in the, in, the, in the situation in which I think it's perfectly okay uh, to do that or think that something similar will happen in, this, in the situation you're in and I will never be in. Nonetheless, despite the lack of this second element, the second element of expecting that the thing planned is what one will really do if the contingency arises. Um, this, he thinks the idea of planning, including contingency plan, planning for situations that will not or cannot arise, makes sense and provides the best interpretation of normative judgment. The strain that arises for an expressivist view in cases of these two kinds is closely related, I think, to the famous frege geech problem of interpreting sentences in which normative judgments are embedded in more complex sentences. All of these problems arise for the same reason. A central originating idea of expressivism is that mere beliefs could not have the practical significance that normative judgments are agreed to have. To explain the link between normative judgment and subsequent attitudes and actions, expressivists say, these judgments must be understood to involve some more active element, such as the adoption of an imperative plan or some pro-attitude. The problems we are now addressing all arise from the fact that normative judgments occur in contexts in which the person who utters them is not doing any of these active things. These are not special or isolated cases. It's natural in talking about practical reasoning to think of judgments about reasons for action as arising in response to, to the question that an agent acts, asks him or herself in deciding what to do. What should I do? And what should I take into account in reaching that conclusion? But as I've already mentioned briefly, judgments about reasons occur just as centrally in interpersonal discourse, in cases in which one is offering advice or discussing what some third party should do, or, very importantly, I think, offering a justification to someone for what one has already done. Consider first the case of advice. When I give someone advice by telling them that they have good reason to do A, what I express to them is not a decision or a plan to do A. Rather, I am urging them to make a decision or adopt such a plan by calling their attention to what I take to be good reasons for doing so. Even more obviously, when I attempt to justify my decision to do A to someone who wanted me not to do this, I'm not merely expressing my decision or plan. Rather, I'm asserting that I had good reason to have made that decision or plan, 
And I'm trying to get the other person to accept that this is so. So the operative normative element in what I'm doing in these cases is not the element linking acceptance of a normative judgment to subsequent action, the link that non-cognitivism was originally designed to explain. It lies rather at a higher level. Advice and justification concern the, 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 the steps toward the adoption of such a judgment, not the downstream effects in which that judgment leads on to subsequent action. The view that I'm recommending captures this difference. I said at the beginning of the lecture that my view was like expressivist views in understanding normative judgments as concerned with our responses to natural facts rather than with those facts themselves. But I then added that normative judgments, on my view, are claims about the correctness or the appropriateness of such reactions. And this difference is crucial. The idea, which I wrote on the blackboard last time, of the relation RPCA, that it's correct for a person uh, in situation C to treat P as a reason for doing A, provides a plausible interpretation of what a person says when she advises a person in circumstances C to do A because P. It is something that people can disagree about, whether P is a reason for someone in C to do A, uh, and something they can argue about, whether or not they take themselves to be in situation C. And it's something they can make assertions about the implication of using embedding, such as if P is a reason for someone in C to do A, then, and so on. They can do all of these things without making any decisions or adopting any plans. Although, if they accept that P is a reason for a person in C to do A and believe themselves to be in C, then, insofar as they are rational, they will intend to do A, or at least count P in favor of doing A. And if they do A, this will be explained by their acceptance of this judgment, or it can be explained. Of course, one of the main points at issue in the debate is whether claims of correctness of the sort that I've just been mentioning make sense, and I'll have a little more to say about this later. But I first want to consider the interpretation that expressivists can offer of what I've just called the higher level of normative discourse and disagreement about whether one should accept a normative judgment about a reason for action, whether one should adopt the plan or not. Try again. The battery is dead, so I have to, oh. I have to go to the shops to buy one. Oh, gosh, that was very quick. It's good service, isn't it? I, mean, <laughs> I think I'll just bring all my electronic devices in here, and <laughs> someone runs out and gets you a battery when they fail. Yeah. That's, that's pretty good. Being in Oxford is really great. <laughs> what expressivists can say here is that the correctness of claims about reasons for action is to be understood with reference to norms governing the formation or abandonment of our first-order attitudes, such as plans. Gibbard, for example, holds that to think that A is what someone in situation C has most reason to do is to plan to do A if one is in that situation. To think that P is a reason for a person in situation C to do A is, on this view, to plan to count P in favor of doing A for the contingency in which one is in situation C. To think that one of these attitudes is correct, one might say, is just to accept certain norms for the formation of these attitudes and to believe that these norms support forming or continuing to hold the attitudes in the epistemic situation in which one now finds oneself. Applying this to interpersonal discussion about reasons, we can say, that to recommend that another person who is in situation C should do A, or that such a person should count P as a reason for doing A, is not only to plan for the contingency in which one is oneself in that situation to do A, or to count P in favor of doing A, what, or doing P, sorry, count P in favor of doing A were one in that situation. It is also to express one's acceptance of these higher order norms governing such attitudes and one's belief that these norms support having the plans just mentioned for behavior in C. That is to say, they support having the plans just mentioned for behavior in C if one is in the, one's current epistemic situation of knowledge about what, what's, what things are like in C. Similarly, someone who offers P as a justification for doing A in situation C 
not only expresses his own acceptance of a plan to count A in favor of P, but also, according to this expressivist view, expresses his acceptance of higher order norms governing these attitudes and expresses his belief that these norms support holding an attitude of counting A, counting P in favor of A in C for someone who is in the epistemic situation of the person who is being urged to accept this justification. This analysis provides a more satisfactory interpretation of interpersonal discourse about reasons than the simpler expressivist account I considered earlier, which relied only on lower order attitudes, such as plans about what to do in certain situations, or about what considerations to count as weighing in favor of these actions. But this more complex account has limitations similar to those of the simpler version. The limitations are brought out when we consider the possibility that the person to whom you offer a justification for your action may reject the higher order norms which your justification appeals to. In offering that justification, according to the expressivist account, you're expressing your acceptance of higher order norms. The other person claims not to accept them. But intuitively, in addition to expressing your acceptance of the norms you're appealing to, you're claiming that these norms are correct. This claim can also be given the same expressivist interpretation. The expressivist can say that in claiming that these higher order norms of norm revision are correct, you're just expressing your acceptance of yet higher order norms, which you believe support holding these norms in the epistemic situation in which you and your interlocutor are placed. Since there can be disagreement about these norms in turn, the threat of regress is clear. The regress can be avoided only by claiming at some level that the relevant norms are correct, in a sense that's not cashed out in terms of your acceptance of yet higher order norms governing norm adoption. The same moves and the same limitation arise for the parallel expressivist strategy for meeting the other condition of internal adequacy that I mentioned. This was that an adequate account of normative judgments must allow for the idea that one's normative judgments are independent of the fact that one holds them and therefore might be mistaken. According to the expressivist account I've been describing, the thought that I might be mistaken in thinking that P is a reason for me to do A could be understood as expressing my plan to count P in favor of A in circumstances like mine, but at the same time also expressing my acceptance of higher order norms governing the acceptance of such plans and the thought that these norms might turn out to support revision of my current attitudes. So I, I have this plan. Uh, I, but I also have these norms, and I say it could happen that the norms for plan adoption would actually, if I were to think about it more, um, tell me to revise these plans. So I might be, that, that's how we understand the idea that we might be uh, mistaken. But it's also intelligible to think that these higher order norms might themselves be mistaken. And one way of expressing this would simply be through the thought that I might come in the future to hold different higher order norms ones that would mandate changing my attitudes toward P and A. But this wouldn't capture the thought that these new attitudes about norm, norm change might be mistaken, since this idea, I just might come to hold different norms, doesn't distinguish between changes that are corrections and changes that involve falling into error. The expressivist strategy I'm considering is to make this dis further distinction by appeal, as I've said before, to yet higher order norms that might require change in my current norms of attitude revision. Since it is intelligible to think that I might also be mistaken in accepting these norms, the possibility of regress is with us again. But a deeper problem is at least alleged to flow from the fact that the norms appealed to at any level to mark the difference between changes in attitude that are corrections and those that are errors must, on the expressive account, be norms that the person in question currently holds. This means that the possibility that one might be fundamentally in error in one's normative beliefs isn't intelligible on this account. The account can make sense of the thought that someone else might be in fundamental normative error. So, as Andy Egan has recently argued in a paper critical of expressivism, the implication of this view seems to be that each of us must regard him or herself as uniquely immune to the possibility of fundamental error. This would be a very odd result. 
A cognitivist view of the kind I'm advancing avoids these difficulties, at least at a formal level. It cuts off the regress of norms at the start by holding that when one makes a normative judgment, one claims that this judgment is correct, rather than merely expressing one's acceptance of norms that support it. A cognitivist would agree that if one of is it, sorry, it would agree that if one of one's normative judgments is mistaken, then there must be a correct norm of, of attitude revision, which would call, in the light perhaps of information that one does not, does not now possess, for the revision of this judgment. But the thought that one's judgment might be incorrect doesn't involve endorsement of any particular such higher order norm. The idea that there must be one is a corollary of the thought that one is mistaken. If I'm mistaken, there must be some norm, uh, I don't know what it is exactly, that would tell me if I had the right information to revise that view. But even if the cognitivist can avoid the regress problem I've been by the regress problem I've been describing, however, I have some doubts about the intelligibility of the thought that all of one's normative judgments might be mistaken, even on a cognitivist view. Might I be mistaken in thinking that pain is in general to be avoided rather than to be sought? I don't see how I could be. What kind of mistake might I be making? To ask this question, what kind of mistake might I be making, is to ask what there is about my current view that some norm, some correct norm, would find faulty. But to ask this question is not to endorse a particular such norm or, any, or, or some particular higher order norm of norm adoption. Nonetheless, the idea that there might be some such fault seems to me inconceivable. But its, inconceiv its inconceivability is a substantive matter, not something which flows from, as, or the inability to even formulate, uh, formulate the thought. We can formulate the thought of, of our being mistaken about any normative matter, but there are some normative matters such, at least I at least, can't conceive that, that I am actually in error about. But the same is true of other people. I can't conceive that they're in, in error about it either. So although I think that Egan's problem looks like a problem, I'm un, I'm un I'm slightly disinclined to put too much weight on it because uh, this idea of thinking that all of one's norms, uh, all of one's normative judgments might be in error um, seems to me a bit of doubtful and a, a doubtful one uh, for substantive reasons. The correctness of a normative judgment, in my view, is independent of one's own view of the matter, which therefore might be mistaken. This chords well with the natural understanding of interpersonal argument and disagreement about normative matters. It's commonsensical. Since the correctness of a normative claim is independent of your opinion and independent of my opinion, its correctness is something you and I can discuss and potentially disagree about, just as we can disagree about who was Prime Minister of Great Britain in 1917. In these respects, the acceptance of a normative judgment is like a belief about some empirical or mathematical question. But many people object to interpreting the acceptance of a normative judgment as a belief. Simon Blackburn, for example, says that this way of understanding ethical judgments in particular is destabilized, he says, by, quote, questions of epistemology and of why we should be concerned about the ethical properties of things. I will take up the question of epistemology in my lecture next week. But there are several things I want to say here about the second question that Blackburn raises, that is, that, that um, a, a cognitivist way of understanding ethical judgments is destabilized uh, because it has to face the question of why we should be concerned about the ethical properties of things. First, it makes a difference here that Blackburn is speaking about ethical truths and beliefs rather than about normative truths and beliefs about them. As I've said in my first lecture, there is an intelligible question why we should care about the moral rightness of our actions. But this further question is a normative question, one that asks for a reason and is answered by giving one. As I pointed out earlier, things are quite different when the subject is normative truth in general. 
there may still be an epistemological question about how I can know truths about what reasons I have. But the question, why should one care about what reasons one has, is nonsensical if it is understood to be asking for a reason to care. Perhaps Blackburn's question, why we should care, asked about normative truth in general, is not one that asks for a reason, but is rather a question about the rational authority of reasons, a version of Korsgaard's question of how normative truths could get a grip on an agent. If this, is, if this is so, it would support the suggestion that I made in my first lecture that not only Kantians but also proponents of many other theories, including, as I suggested then, some desire theories, and in this case, if it were right, expressivism, believe that the authority of reasons must be grounded in something that an agent already accepts, according to Kantians, grounded in the agent's own will, and perhaps also grounded in the agent's own will in the view of some expressivists, if accepting a plan or an imperative is an expression of one's will. There is a deep divide here. As I said in my first lecture, when it's true that P is a reason for someone to do A, the grip that P has on that person is just the normative relation being a reason for. Since the question of whether something is a reason is a question one asks in deciding what one's will in the matter is to be, Grounding the answer to such questions in the agent's will doesn't seem like a possibility. Although it may sound excessive to say it, the claim that all claims about reasons must be grounded in the will seems to me to threaten to eliminate reasons altogether. A less extreme and more common way of understanding Blackburn's question, why should we care, is to take it as a question about how a mere belief about reasons could explain action. This is a genuine question, and I've offered an answer to it earlier in the lecture. It does follow from the answer I've given, however, that if the acceptance of a normative judgment is a form of belief, it does differ from other beliefs, such as empirical beliefs and mathematical beliefs, in being rationally related to intentions and actions rather than merely to other beliefs. By a rational relation here, I mean a connection that it is irrational to deny. Factual beliefs can have a weaker form of rational connection with action insofar as they are beliefs about things that provide reasons. A person who has such a belief that it's very dangerous to do a certain action, let's say, is open for, to, to rational criticism for not treating this fact as a reason. But this is a different kind of criticism, and the failure to, the failure to treat something as a reason in violation of that, you know, leaving one open to that criticism, isn't always irrational. By contrast, it is irrational to judge some consideration to be a reason to do A and then to refuse to treat it as such a reason. That's the kind of rational connection I'm talking about. Now, it might be maintained that if acceptance of a normative judgment has this kind of rational connection with action, then it is not a belief, since, by definition maybe, beliefs don't have such connections. But absent some further argument, this claim seems to me merely stipulative. Little turns on the label belief as long as it is recognized that judgments about reasons are of a sort that can be correct or incorrect independent of their being made, and thus that they behave like beliefs in interpersonal argument, discussion, and disagreement. Arguments have, however, been argued, offered against the possibility of a state, whether called a belief or not, that has the features I'm claiming for the acceptance of a normative judgment. Direction of fit arguments, so-called, maintain that no state can have standards of correctness, a mind-to-world direction of fit in the jargon, and also rational connections to intention and action, a world-to-mind direction of fit. This claim has some plausibility as long as the world in question is taken to be the natural world of physical objects, causes, and effects. For any proposition P about that world, a belief that P has a mind-to-world direction of fit. That is, a person is open to rational criticism if he or she does not modify this belief in the face of cred credible evidence that P is false. Any such P might also be a good reason for some action A. If so, then a person who believes P and fails to treat it as reason for A is making a normative error and thus open to a kind of rational criticism. 
But this criticism is appropriate in virtue of the truth of a further normative claim, namely that P is a reason for someone in that situation to do A, not simply in virtue of the fact that the agent believes P. So a belief that P is linked to standards of correctness, that is, must fit the world, simply by being the kind of state that it is. But it's not rationally tied to action in this same way. In order to be a belief, it doesn't have to have this link. This argument depends, however, on the assumption that the belief in question is a belief about the natural world. If it is not, if the relevant standard of correctness is not fitting with the natural world, but some other form of correctness, then the second half of the argument fails. In particular, if the belief in question is a belief that P is a good reason to do A, then it is simply in virtue of being the kind of state that it is, and not in virtue of any further normative fact, that a person who has that belief, uh, who believes that P is a reason for someone in his situation to do A, would be irrational in refusing to treat P as such a reason. The plausibility of the argument that a state cannot have both mind-to-world and world-to-mind directions to fit is limited to cases in which the world referred to in both cases is the natural one. The tendency to think that this argument rules out interpreting normative judgments as a kind of belief is thus another instance of the tendency I mentioned in my second lecture to identify the set of all things independent of us about which our opinions can be correct or incorrect with the natural world of physical objects, causes, and effects. Nonetheless, there are reasonable questions about how the idea of correctness that is supposed to apply to normative judgments is to be understood. On expressivist views, the essential content of such judgments is given by some active element, such as adopting a plan or accepting an imperative, which renders these judgments incapable of being true or false. My strategy has been to export this active element to account for the distinctive practical significance of judgments about reasons by appeal to the idea of rational agency. The remaining content, the pure claim that something is a reason, is left as something that can be true or false and that one can be mistaken about and that can function in interpersonal discourse like any other proposition. The question is how this residual content, the claim of correctness and the claim that something is a reason is to be understood. The obvious significance of judgments about reasons lies in their rational links with action. If this is all there is, then it would seem that the cognitivism I'm proposing may just collapse into another form of expressivism. The question might be answered by providing a metaphysical account of the truth conditions of normative judgments, thus providing them with distinctive content over and above the link with action which is provided by the ideal of rational agency. But my minimalist interpretation of normative truth rules out such an account. The idea that normative judgments are correct when they correspond to the normative facts is no explanation if these facts are, as I have suggested, following Gibbard's remark, merely the reflection of true thoughts. So, it may be said, the question remains what the content of these thoughts is and what it is that makes them true. At this point, I believe, defenders of irreducibly normative truths must dig in their heels. The idea of a consideration's being a good reason for an action or for an attitude is, it seems to me, a perfectly intelligible one. To believe that some consideration is a reason is not the same thing as treating that consideration as a reason in one subsequent deliberation. There is such a thing as irrationally failing to act in accord with the reasons one believes oneself to have. Given the intelligibility of this idea and the fact that taking it at face value provides the best fit with our practices of thinking about reasons and our practices of arguing about reasons with others, we should reject this interpretation only if it gives rise to some difficulties that cannot be satisfactorily answered. I've argued that the idea of irreducibly normative truths does not have implausible metaphysical implications, and, today, that the connection between beliefs about reasons and substantive action, subsequent action can be satisfactorily explained. 
there remains the epistemological question of how we can know what reasons we have. The question, what makes normative judgments true, might be understood as a way of asking this question. That is, a way of asking how the correctness of normative judgments can be assessed and established. I will take up this question next week. And as I will say then, I believe that there are grounds for some rather limited expectations on this score. If one were to have a systematic account of the procedures through which normative truths can be established, then one might simply identify the idea of a normative judgments being correct with its being established in this way, upheld by these procedures. For various reasons, I doubt that this strategy will work, but I will explore the possibility somewhat in my next lecture. Aside from worries about how the idea of the correctness of normative judgments is to be understood, however, questions may also be raised about the importance that this idea of correctness should have for us. I've suggested that it is important in two contexts. First, in making sense of the idea that the correctness or incorrectness of our normative judgments is independent of our making them. And second, in interpreting interpersonal discourse and disagreement about normative matters. But each of these forms of importance, intrapersonal and interpersonal importance, may be open to question. Suppose you and I disagree about whether the fact that someone injured me is a good reason for me to injure him in return. Perhaps I maintain that it is, and you deny this. Suppose we go on for some time, arguing about it, and adducing all the considerations that either of us can think of to get the other to change his mind. But in the end, we still disagree. It would be pointless and empty for me at this point to insist, as if it were a trump card, but my view is correct. It is a reason. Such an appeal to correctness would be mere foot stomping. Similarly, in the intrapersonal case, if one believes that something is a reason, it's natural to think that it would be a reason whether or not one believed that it was. But why should this be so important to us? If we are convinced that something is a reason and ready to act on that consideration, why should we be concerned to have the imprimatur of some independent standard of correctness? As Nietzsche would say, the need for the prop of such an external standard betrays a kind of weakness. And in a similar vein, Simon Blackburn has written that it's sad that some people should feel the need for Apollonian authority, as he puts it, rather than being content to accept the motivation provided by their own contingent emotions and desires. As I will say in my next lecture, I think there are cases in which the interpersonal version of this worry points toward a genuine issue. We should, maybe a little modesty is in order about how confident we should be that our judgments about reasons are correct. But neither worry provides grounds for rejecting a concern with the idea of norm, oh sorry, neither of these worry worries provides grounds for rejecting concern with the idea that normative judgments can be correct or incorrect. To insist at the conclusion of an unsuccessful attempt to persuade someone that your normative judgment is, after all, correct, is indeed unhelpful foot stomping. But this is equally unhelpful when the disagreement is about some empirical fact. But the earth is getting warmer, I say. Right? It doesn't help much to persuade you, even though I'm right. So this doesn't show that the idea of correctness is misplaced or better done away with in the normative case. It's just dialectically unhelpful. Moreover, the idea that when we disagree about a normative question, there is some fact of the matter we are disagreeing about, which is independent of each of us, and which neither of us has any special authority to determine, provides, if anything, I would say, a more attractive picture of the situation and the relation between us than the idea that what we are doing is each simply trying to get the other to adopt the same plan that we have adopted. Of course, the fact that this interpretation of our disagreement is attractive, if it is, is not any reason to think that it's true that normative judgments can be correct or incorrect. My aim in mentioning the attractiveness of the idea, however, is just to rebut the suggestion that to be concerned that there should be a notion of correctness betrays the desire to claim an implausible and unattractive kind of authority over others for the correctness of one's own position. 
Nor is it the case when several alternative courses of action seem appealing to me, uh, does it indicate a kind of weakness to ask myself what I really have more reason to do. The idea that it betrays a kind of weakness may derive from thinking that being concerned with the correctness of one's normative beliefs involves looking for some authority, some standard outside of me that will tell me what I ought to do. But this idea of an outside standard is simply a misleading metaphor. For any outside standard in the form of a set of principles or precepts, there's the question, why do that? Why accept that standard? But when I arrive at a conclusion about the correctness of a normative judgment, the the conclusion that I really do have a reason to do what will save my life or to avoid pain, there is no such further, further question, why do that? Because I've answered it by saying that it's a reason. These conclusions carry their own normative authority, as it were. They do not need to derive this authority from some further source. The question of correctness is the question of whether they do have this authority, whether the considerations in question really are reasons. There's no further question beyond this one. But there are serious questions